So, thank you all for being here. Um, my name is Omri. I want to present today uh, effective text classification, um, but also for image and audio data using active learning and guided search. So, briefly, I'm going to talk about the challenges of creating data sets, training and test, um, give a brief intro to active learning. I'm going to overview uh, an open source platform called Okano that at Gongayo we extended and released today. Um, and also lessons learned by uh, creating machine learning models and future directions for the platform that I hope many of you will make use of. A few words about me. I had the research department at Gongayo. I teach data science and deep learning in Bar Ilan University and uh, Yandex Y Data Program. Um, and very happy to connect later. At Gongayo, what we do is record, transcribe, and analyze sales calls, uh, hoping to provide insights like top salespeople talk more about the competition, but only after they've talked about the value of the platform for X number of minutes. And in order to do that, we have to create many models. We start from uh, uh, audio calls, we automatically transcribe them, analyze them, separate them into speakers, analyze key spots in them, um, extract data from emails, and many other things that we need to do in order to complete this pipeline. And all of those things are created in-house. We are not using third-party services. Uh, and these things require data. And we know that uh, data sets are very important. As Fei Fei Li is saying, data sets play a crucial role in advancing AI. Uh, Marissa Mayer is saying that with data collection, the sooner the better is always the best answer. And we know those uh, uh, quotes as well. We understand that data is important, but getting data is not obvious for a specific domain. As we all know, the battle for training data can be nasty. At Gong, uh, and recently in the past year, uh, there are other considerations we have to take into account. Data privacy with GDPR and other laws is crucial right now. For example, for us, the data can't actually leave the US. It has to reside on servers in the US. Um, all of the clients of Gong as a company have to approve each provider that we use. So if we want to switch from a AWS to Google Cloud, for example, we have to go to all of the companies that we already have and have them sign that it's okay for us to move their data. Uh, all of the companies that we use as services sign a DPA, which means that they will not use the data for anything else. Um, and we want to make sure that people can access all the data. This kind of means that Google Sheets is not a good labeling platform for us. We can't just take a file and move it around. We have to work with a pretty robust labeling platform. We need something that works for large scale, but can also assist us in the process of creating effective machine learning models. And when you start working with things, you learn that teaching machines is a pretty expensive business. I mean more or less transcribing an hour of speech costs $100. Uh, and in order to get a decent performance uh, from a system, you need around 1,000 hours. That means that you just need to pay just for labeling without the labor and computation and all of the other things, around $100,000 to get a, a system that's not state of the art. You probably need to spend much more than that. Figure eight was previously called Crowdflower, provider, top provider for uh, uh, labeling services. You pay around 10 cents per one annotation of a text sentence. If you want to get around 1,000 label sentences with 1% prevalence in, in the, in the uh, data set, you would pay $10,000 just for a single labeling platform for just one labeler. If you want to get average of three or five people, you'd pay more if you just sample those things randomly. And um, when you're dealing with a specific domain, like sales, you need domain experts. These cost much more than people who just, you know, sit at home and do some mechanical work stuff, okay? So let's go through one example. One of the things that we detect in uh, sales calls are action items. I'll send you an email after the call. Let's touch base next Tuesday, but not let me share my screen with you. Okay, we want to detect those and extract them from sales calls automatically so the salesperson would have a list of things that he uh, promised. 
Now, when we do something like that, we know that there are sentences that are pretty easy to, you know, understand are not action items. Hey, Josh, how are you? Is not an action item. I probably don't want my labelers to spend time on such sentences that are pretty obvious, okay, to the machine. So my claim is that we can build a model. It doesn't have to be state of the art. It doesn't have to be very powerful, but it would be able to do a pretty well, a pretty good job in telling us if something is definitely an action item definitely not an action item or maybe an action item okay and this um, concept is rooted in other machine learning uh, concepts like the margin of support vector machines or ensemble learning okay we put together several weak classifiers in Gong we've seen that for example in a project for classifying video frames we are working on, we, we have a video call and we want to know what's better for a salesperson to do a webcam share or share the, uh, the uh, screen of a presentation or some browser demo. Okay? And we want to be able to classify those uh, images on the screen, on the video track. And we build a basic model. And we can see that the model has high confidence in slides of on the left side and low confidence for slides in the right side okay and these slides are very different from one another but all of them are you know pretty well recognized as slides on the right side things are pretty difficult for a person as well you see what happens here somebody is showing a PDF inside a browser is this a browser demo or a presentation we're not really sure okay and one of the things we learn is when you're starting with your labels for a task, you have to refine them and adapt them as you go because you see cases where you don't even, as someone that defined the problem, know how to handle them. Last year in the Data Science Summit, I gave a workshop about active learning. And we've, y you can access the, the GitHub repo and, and follow along with the Jupyter Notebooks. But one of the things we've seen is that for many algorithms, the model confidence is correlated with the actual accuracy of the model, given uh, the correct labels. Okay, which means that when the model has low accuracy, it tends to make mistake. Uh, low confidence, it tends to make mistake, mistakes, and maybe we can use that information to improve the model. We've also um, looked at the active learning process, which basically, in, in the example. I gave last year meant that during training, okay, the machine can ask what it wants to learn uh, uh, from. So it's not just getting labeled data and learns from that. It can ask for specific examples and the labels that correspond to them in order to improve its performance. We can see that the, the black graph reaches higher and fa uh, performance faster than all the other more powerful algorithms. And this uh, shift uh, happens in many different companies nowadays. So I've mentioned Crowdflower. It recently changed its name to Figure 8. And they say that uh, the new name uh, and identity brings into focus Figure 8's core philosophy of human-in-the-loop practices being the essential ingredient to make AI work in the real world, especially the iterative process of active learning. The creators, uh, the creators of uh, Spacey, uh, the leading uh, package nowadays for NLP um, processing, created Prodigy, uh, a paid commercial suite for uh, uh, creating models based on active learning. Amazon recently released Ground Truth as part of SageMaker that also takes uh, makes use of active learning in order to improve and efficiently teach uh, uh, machine learning models. So what does it actually mean, okay, active learning? The basic framework is that we have a small set of labeled trainings, training data. We build a machine learning model. We apply this model on a large pool of unlabeled labeled, uh, uh, instances. And based on this pool, okay, we select the uh, observations that would be sent to a human oracle. And this oracle would give us the true labels based on them and continue the loop. So we don't just get random uh, 
a random uh, set of labeled data from our large unlabeled set, but we get those that are supposedly would improve the algorithm performance the most. There are several different types of active learning. Uh, the first one is membership query synthesis. This think of uh, like a robot that tries to learn how to work in the real world. And this robot might say, let's hypothesize that we hypothesize that we have some state of the world. I'm generating this for you. How should I behave in this uh, uh, setting? And the oracle said, if this is the case that you've asked about, okay, hypothetically, this is how you should behave. Okay, so the robot learns based on that. Another type is stream-based selective sampling. We have lots of data coming in and the uh, machine learning model decides to query the oracle about a few of those as they come. Here you can think about uh, fraud detection. We have many transactions, but the uh, machine learning model says, I'm not too sure about these uh, examples. Let's send them to an analyst that would tell me what I was supposed to do to say on this, and these would be used in the model. And what is most useful for us and Gong and and other, uh, uh, many other applications, pool-based sampling, where we just have a big pool of unlabeled data, and from this pool we select what we want to get labels uh, for and what's not. So, as AWS also uh, uh, presents here, we can ask human labelers, who are pretty costly, to uh, tell, uh, to classify images as belonging to a certain species of uh, birds, um, and let the neural network annotate easy images, which is much cheaper to a large uh, volume. Okay, so based on all of these requirements and these ideas, we've taken uh, a, an annotation tool that was de developed by uh, Haki Works, it's some uh, uh, small group of students. Um, and we, it's the, the project itself is still under development there, but we extended that in Gong to fit our needs and included in it active learning, guided search, more templates to uh, suit uh, cases of not just text, but also image and audio, uh, support for Postgres, large scale database, and many other things that I'm going to review with you. Behind the scenes, um, Docano is using Django, which is a web framework written in Python. It's great because it's very easy to plug in your machine learning code, PyTorch, whatever model you want. You can use pandas, you can create images and uh, add them into the platform very easily. Um, there's support for uh, Postgres and other large scale data sets. So we've, we're using it for hundreds of thousands of documents for labeling and it works uh, very efficiently and, and well. And it uses Vue.js for a front end uh, network which provides a good uh, and powerful uh, templating engine. So a few examples, we can see a text document with several labels and the annotator logs into the system sees the document and starts annotating. We can also use Docano for sequence labeling. So for example, named entity recognition. You can see it here, we can select from the different labels. It's also useful for sequence to sequence annotations. So we can show, um, for example, for machine translation, a, a sentence in one language and translate it into other languages and even provide several uh, uh, translations. We extended it to several other tasks. For example, here you can see we're training an OCR model and we're showing an uh, image and ask the, customer, the labeler to transcribe the header. I mean, it's very easy to write your own templates. We have several of those for uh, image classification, image captioning, and other things as well. How does the workflow work? You start with creating, a, a, as an admi admin, you start with creating a, a project, you set the project type, you set the labels, you write your guidelines, very important for labelers. They can always refer back to the guidelines as they annotate the document. Um, you upload your records, they are saved in the database. Um, 
they must contain a text field, if it's text specification or a URL to the image or audio file that would be shown, they can include the ground truth or metadata. If you set the ground truth, we compare the performance of labelers to actual ground truth and give you statistics on that. If you provide metadata, we give you the ability to query based on metadata. For emails, for example, we want to only see now emails sent by the client and not the prospect, stuff like that. Um, you assign labels to the project and labels just log in and start annotating your, uh, your uh, database. So the first step that we've seen people do when they get to those things is not start with a few examples, label them, but then they start having some guesses. If I'm looking at hotel reviews, for example, I kind of get a feeling that if I would be looking for this place is I'd have a very good indication if it's a positive or a negative review. This place is awesome, this place is horrible, this place is whatever. Okay? So we allow people to search for a specific tax, we highlight that in the document, and give them a, a simple way to start annotating uh, uh, the process. Then we see that they also come up with things that if they find in the document, they know they have very good uh, um, chances of being one of the classes. Okay, so I love this hotel would be a very good indication for a five-star review. Though it can be, I love this hotel, but I don't know what happened last time. It was horrible. Okay, we see we also see those things, and we discuss how can how we can take them into account. So um, while labeling. Behind the scenes, we have a machine learning model that predicts the labels based on the labels uh, of human annotators, okay? And so it runs the model and starts to assign to uh, uh, the labelers documents with low confidence. These are cases where the model finds it difficult to get uh, um, good predictions, okay? We also, if you want, allow the labelers to see the predicted a, a class and probability of the model. So it can go both ways and it's pretty risky uh, practice. We don't always do that, but we let you decide if you want to activate that. You might tell the labeler, we're pretty confident this has a five star review, but obviously it biases the uh, uh, annotation of the labeler. So use this with caution. We also have an explain mode, which you might want to activate, which would highlight the specific features here, words, that help the, the machine reach its decision. And this allows the uh, labeler to pretty quickly know where to hone in, in the sometimes large document, and get pretty efficiently to the true uh, uh, label. This machine learning model that runs behind, behind the scenes can be whatever you want. For an image classification test, it can be, it can be an image net a network, inception v3, take the final uh, layer before the output layer, and use that for a basis for your own classifier or anything else. What we've seen is that we want this model to be fast, not to overfit, and be pretty good at ranking, but not necessarily in classification. Doesn't have to provide state-of-the-art performance. On the contrary, you actually don't want it to be a very powerful model. You want it to make mistakes. You want it to be uh, not very efficient. For text, we usually go with logistic regression. There are other models that can uh, work pretty well for that. This will not be your final model. This is just a process for you to get to a, an effective training set as you uh, go pretty quickly. And we also highlight in the admin report the top features that help to reach the decision if you want to get more ideas for later on in the process. Then we make use of semi-supervised learning. Uh, the concept here is that we don't just use our labeled data set. We have a large uh, data set of unlabeled data. And we want to make use of that. There are several concepts. The first one, for example, is entropy minimization. We want our model to be pretty confident about its predictions. And if it's not, we want to help it reach a, a, a point of low uh, entropy and more confidence about its predictions. A different way to do, to do semi-supervised learning is smoothness enforcing. Here you want to make sure that your predictions, the model's predictions for data that was augmented or that 
added, you added some noise to would be pretty similar, okay? You expect things to be pretty smooth. And uh, another concept is pseudo the labeling. So what you do here, it's also called bootstrapping, is you build a classifier and you take examples that had a high probability of belonging to a certain class and treat them as actually only belonging to the class, okay, with some weight, obviously, because you also have true labels, and you run your model in an EM fashion, uh, expectation maximi maximization several times, and, and get to a model that uh, uses more and more information as you go. And, and sort of labeling is integrated into the kernel, into the process. On the admin side, you have reports. So you can see the performance of each of your labelers on the ground truth. This is very important because you want, this is an iterative process. Creating data set is not fire and forget. You want people to better understand your guidelines. You want to uh, show them how they can be better as you go. And, uh, and this is a, a pretty efficient tool. It also allows you to calculate the inter-rater agreement and see cases where, where uh, labelers don't agree on things. Even if you don't have the correct label, cases where different humans don't agree on things are usually where you want to focus your attention and understand why they uh, have difficulty agreeing. Um, you, are, you can also compute the labeling speed, get the labeling speed of each labeler, which is important because you want to know how much time and how much money you're going to spend on each task and maybe decide that it's worth the effort or not. And as you go, you get better and better understanding of your data set, your labels, and how you want to work with those things. So um, I've reviewed most of these things, but you can see even large differences between what the model predicts and human annotations. From our experience, many times these are just wrong labels of the ground truth that you want to better understand. Uh, if your model is not using something that is important, you want to uh, make sure that you make use of features that might not be in the model right now and make use of those. Um, a few other things that we've learned when crea while creating data sets. As I've said, it's an ongoing process. I've ga I gave this example of a PDF inside a browser. You need to make a decision. What is that? And during labeling, many times we just give a, a generic uh, label of other and review that later on and decide to come up with more and more better and more refined labels as uh, we go. Uh, in Gong, we actually have someone who is a research project manager, and her position is to work with labelers and data scientists and product and understand the, the requirements and understand the flow and understand that it's not just, okay, somebody give me the data or um, I'm just, you know, starting with guidelines and don't really understand the, uh, the requirements, but to work on a project and learn more and more as, as we go. And um, obviously this is work in progress. You can all access that. We'd be very happy to assist you with integrating Docano into your workflow. We mainly focus on text classification in Gong, but we also work with uh, image and audio data uh, using this uh, platform. Um, so we're going to improve the support for tasks beyond text classification. We started uh, adding suggested terms for the guided search using word vectors. Um, we also plan to embed pretty powerful models eventually when you, you, when you want to say, okay, I think I have enough data, now bring, in, bring me a model that I can use in production and work with that. And I don't have time to go in depth into that, but uh, part of the process that I've described is that, is that as we go, we have better and better understanding of things that might be labeling functions and might be used for data programming like uh, in packages like Snorkel. So these are functions that can give a pretty uh, good precision most of the time but with low coverage and a model learns how to interweave them together in a generative model to improve the uh, performance of the final model. Um, We'd be very happy to have you contribute to, uh, to Docano. As I've said, I haven't seen many annotation tools that can be used 
for actual projects that meet the requirements of the industry and that work in large scale. Very open to all of those things, um, both requests for features and actually contributing. So we'd be very happy to have this discussion and thank you for your time. <laughs>